All right, welcome, Anna. Anna Lepret's uh, presentation is entitled Killer Quantum Wombats. <laughs> Wrangling the Bethard's Massey Collection of Popular Music Arrangements in her bio. Anna Lepret has been the music librarian at the Great American Songbook Foundation since April 2021. Prior to that, Anna was a cataloger in the Cook Music Library at Indiana University Bloomington. Anna has served as the web editor for Moog for several years and is an active member of MLA. Her review of a compilation of 19th century piano music written by women composers was published in the December issue of Notes. Anna holds a Master of Library Science with Music Librarianship Specialization from Indiana University, a Master of Music in Music History and Literature from the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, and a Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance from the uh, University of Utah. And uh, just remember that we will hold questions until Anna's presentation is finished. All right, Anna, I think we're ready. Go ahead and share your screen. Mm -hmm. All right, I see it. Yeah, but again, I can't see the notes. Hang oh. on. There we go. Can you see my notes? Nope, we cannot. Excellent. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I dive into sharing my own work, let me tell you a little about the organization I work for. The Great American Songbook Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to inspire and educate by celebrating the timeless standards of pop, jazz, Broadway, and Hollywood, otherwise known as the Great American Songbook. Founded in 2007 by five-time Grammy Award nominee Michael Feinstein, the foundation advances this rich legacy by curating physical artifacts of its creators, performers, and publishers in the songbook library and archives. Operating a multimedia exhibit gallery, overseeing the Songbook Hall of Fame, offering programs for the public and research opportunities for scholars and artists, and providing educational opportunities for student musicians, including the annual Songbook Academy Summer Intensive. The foundation is a cultural affiliate of the Los Angeles-based Grammy Museum. We are committed to perpetuating this music and its history by preserving the physical artifacts of the songbook's creators, performers, and publishers, and making these cultural treasures accessible through intergenerational programming that focuses on interactive, educational, and immersive experiences for all. Despite its title, The Great American Songbook is not a book. Rather, it is the body of timeless American popular songs and jazz standards that continue to be reimagined and reinterpreted. Many of these songs originated in Broadway musicals and reviews, Hollywood films, or on Tin Pan Alley. While we primarily focus on the music from the 1920s to 1960s, we believe that the songbook continues to be written. Today, it is easier than ever to reinterpret a favorite song and release it on TikTok or YouTube. Who can say whether in 50 or 100 years, we're still talking about We Don't Talk About Bruno? Our current exhibit, From the Jazz Age to Streaming, the soundtrack of the 2020s, explores the music and cultures of the 1920s and the 2020s, comparing the common background of political and racial tensions and global pandemics and the ways music is and was created, consumed, and discovered. You can view this in previous exhibits on our website at thesongbook.org. The Songbook Foundation Library and Archives was created in 2008 with the receipt of the Gus Kahn and Donald Kahn collections. Since that date, it has expanded to include the collections of Meredith Wilson, Harold Arlen, Ray Charles, the arranger, and numerous others. The library and archives works to serve the teaching and research needs of its user communities by collecting as comprehensively as possible those materials that have enduring value to, to documenting the history of American popular music. 
The library and archives are housed off-site in an office building about half a mile away. Until 2021, the library and archives employed only one staff member, Lisa Lobdell, an archivist of many talents. I was brought on board on April 19th, 2021, as the second full-time staff member, the music librarian, through the assistance of an IMLS grant to begin processing the immense Beathard's Massey collection. The Beathard's Massey collection is actually about 30 collections that were separately acquired by two people, Kurt Massey and Jack Beathard's. Until 1950, American popular music centered around live performance. Publishers and arrangers cranked out stock arrangements of the day's hits by the thousands, delivering them to the libraries of orchestras in stage and vaudeville theaters, hotels and ships, and later movie theaters and studios. Radio stations had house orchestras that performed live on the air and formed libraries to serve these orchestras. As this era ended, however, most of these collections were thrown away or burned. Much like Michael Feinstein himself, Massey and Bethards were dismayed at this loss and began acquiring as many of the collections as they could. Massey acquired the library from the Los Angeles NBC radio studios as well as those of subsidiaries in San Jose and San Francisco and donated it, some 13,800 items to the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California in 1974, where it was not touched for many, many years. In 1987, Beathard's 75,500 item collection also made its way ah, to the Paramount. The Paramount Theater was the largest multi-purpose theater on the West Coast when it was built in 1931. Beathard said in giving most of this collection to the Paramount Theater in 1987 to be combined with the Paramount's current collection of similar material given by Kurt Massey many years ago, it is my desire to create the finest library of American popular music in the Western states. What more perfect place to house it than the Paramount Theater? which epitomizes America's popular culture at the height of the live music business. Beathers describes the contents of the collection as covering anything which can be considered popular music and even some of these so-called classics from about 1890 to 1950. He enumerated dance, ragtime, circus, silent film accompaniment, operetta and show tunes, salon music, jazz, and anything else that might have been played for popular audiences throughout those years, either live or over radio. A brochure from the Paramount boasted about their FileMaker Pro database containing almost 180,000 records from sources including local ABC, CBS, and NBC radio stations. The number in parentheses is the number of entries in the database. Additionally, there were collections from individuals comprising solos, songs, dance, band, stock, and theater orchestra arrangements. The largest of the collections belonged to Walter Rudolph, an arranger, conductor, and pianist. I found this article in his scrapbook that contained a passage that I thought would resonate with this group. It says, Greek mythology tells of a certain Corinthian king called Sisyphus, who was condemned in the lower world to push a huge boulder to the top of a mountain. Just as he reached the summit, the boulder would roll away and Sisyphus had to repeat this act incessantly. Walter Rudolph, noted Oakland pianist, has set himself a task that is likewise endless. He decided one fateful day to catalog all the music he owned in order to make any piece instantly accessible. He is still cataloging it. The article continues, it probably seems simple enough to list each piece in a book and give it a special place on his shelves. It would have been simple too, were it not for the fact that practically all the publications of America's leading music houses come to Rudolph in a steady stream. As we all know, no cataloging project is ever simple. The Paramount did not have the resources to handle a collection like this and do it justice. 
So in 2019, the grand collection came to the Great American Songbook Foundation in 486 crates. As you can imagine, the logistics for moving a collection this size, which came to over 2,000 linear feet, without messing up the order, were a nightmare. So where do I come in? The Songbook Foundation applied for and received a two-year grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services to hire a music librarian to begin the process of organizing and cataloging the collection. I started work on April 19th, 2021, about five months into the grant period. The grant application largely followed a plan laid out by the Paramount Theater, outlining a pilot project to catalog the stock arrangements of popular music, beginning with the KQW collection. The Paramount estimated that 30 to 40% of the total published collection were duplicates and could be deaccessioned. At the end of the grant period, I was to have at least 1,900 mark records, a detailed processing guide, at least two finding aids, and the foundation was to have a documented plan to sustain the music librarian position, process the entire collection in 10 to 15 years, and share it with broader audiences. To help me with this, all I had was a spreadsheet, actually three spreadsheets with a combined 150,000 rows that supposedly listed every title across every collection. At this point, I had a lot more questions than answers, such as how do we foresee this collection being used? How do we want it to be used? What all is in this collection? And where the heck is the KQW stuff? Seriously, though, the collection had been carefully packed to retain the original order from the Paramount Theater, but it was spread out over our warehouse and not everything was marked. So as our esteemed founder, Michael Feinstein said, how in the heck do you find anything? Finding KQW seemed like finding a needle in a haystack, which led me to this question. What would Michelle Hahn do? And I started to map out the collection. Eventually, I found KQW tucked into the end of aisle 35. At this time, I was living in Bloomington and coming to Carmel once every two weeks, a 90-minute drive that felt longer with a squalling toddler. Most days, I was working from home, attempting to get a handle on that darn spreadsheet. There were 150,000 lines with shelf numbers and titles, many misspelled, most missing names of contributors, and those that had them were often misspelled, incomplete, or simply wrong. The collection names themselves were inconsistent. I knew there were duplicate sets across the collections and that this spreadsheet was supposed to help me find them, but I didn't know how. As it turned out, some of the entries were themselves duplicates. So to help me clean up the spreadsheet, I thought to myself, what would Maristella do? And I downloaded Open Refine. Using its life-changing magic, I added or corrected composer and lyricist information, refined the 77 collections down to 29, and cleaned up the titles. I was ready to focus on KQW. The Paramount Theater suggested starting with the KQW collection because at about 450 titles, it was quite small, and because it was the oldest and in the worst physical shape. The radio station KQW in San Jose was founded by Charles Doc Harold, a man often acknowledged as the inventor of radio broadcasting. KQW was the first radio station to broadcast regular programming to a general audience. I did, by the way, check with our own Charles Chuck Harold, and there is no connection. For the rest of my presentation, I will talk about some of the fun finds and issues I encountered in processing the KQW collection and how its unique features and our hopes for its use informed my decision making, as well as some things I've learned. Before I could begin the processing, however, I had to consider what our goals for the collection were. Our first hope for the collection is that the arrangements will be performed. To that end, I'm doing full cataloging and Wildcat so that they are discoverable. Secondly, we hope that researchers will use the collection to learn more about how this music was performed, especially by live radio orchestras. 
how musicians engaged with the printed parts and the music itself. I'll talk more about how this informs my process in a bit. This was my opportunity to decide how I wanted the final collection to look and be organized. This was my chance to create the perfect library I'd always dreamed about. Although the collection will likely never be openly browsable, I really liked the idea of all arrangements being housed next to each other. I adapted the quasi-LC call number system Indiana University uses for their performing ensemble division materials. Every title is classed as M999, followed by a composer cutter from the Cutter Sandburn table, title cutter and publication date. Arrangements published in the same year, which happens frequently, get a lowercase letter appended to the end of the date, beginning with a B. Finally, if there's a vocal part, usually a vocal trio, included in the arrangement, I put an asterisk at the end of the call number to make it immediately clear. Arrangements are housed in Tyvek envelopes and labeled with the call number, as well as the composer, title, and arranger. Before I could begin cataloging, though, there was other work to be done. Because of the nature of the music, many of the arrangements were held in multiple collections. I used that spreadsheet to find all the shelf numbers with that title. I quickly realized that rather than only cataloging arrangements held in KQW, it made the most sense to catalog all the arrangements of a single title at once. I also quickly discovered several quirks about the spreadsheet. For example, each song contained in a medley or folio was listed separately. Some collections would list a title once, but actually have multiple arrangements in separate folders. I didn't yet know to look for that. And of course, there were several collections I haven't even located yet. Once I retrieved all the sets, I wanted to assemble the cleanest possible set. Sometimes that entails spreading them out across my desk or even the floor. It turns out that sometimes different arrangements get mixed up together. Plus, the stewards of these collections were not intimately familiar with WEMI and what constitutes a new manifestation. It was further complicated by the fact that occasionally an arrangement would be published in both a large ensemble and a small ensemble form. Fortunately, the collection managers included a part listing, so I know what I was looking for and made sure I got every part. Although it is not common practice, I do list every part in a 500 note in the bibliographic record. This information is useful to people looking to perform this music, and it is also useful to catalogers trying to determine if the item in hand matches the item described. It wasn't as simple, however, as just assembling a single clean set and setting the rest aside for deaccessioning. What was I to do with the myriad parts with markings on them? This, I admit, required a shift in thinking on my part. Before coming to the foundation, I was a cataloger at the Cook Music Library at Indiana University, which has an enormous, heavily circulated collection of scores. Scores and parts were often returned covered in markings and not always in pencil. We had student workers erase parts at the circulation desk. Unless the scores and markings had belonged to distinguished composers, performers, or scholars, I tended to think of them as nuisances rather than as having any intrinsic significance. But then I thought about the scores I had inherited from my grandmother, the only other musician in my family who died when I was nine, leaving me all her music and her gorgeous 1915 Mason and Hamlin piano. I can't tell you the number of times I've selected a piece to study and pulled the music just to discover that she had played it herself and left me messages. These markings are the only indications I have of how she played. They are invaluable to me, but probably just a nuisance to anybody else. So with that in mind, I asked myself, what would Michael Feinstein do? He would keep them all. That's what Michael Feinstein would do. Markings can tell us a great deal about how this music was used and engaged with. They range in significance from scribbles and the rantings of disgruntled session musicians to indications of alternate instrumentations and actually changed notes. In that light, therefore, in addition to, to a clean set, any parts with significant markings are being retained. Significant, of course, is a highly subjective term that includes alternate instruments, cuts, segues to other songs, chord symbols, 
conductors' parts, people's names, the use of mutes, changes in notes, caricatures, and snarky comments. This is a picture of an arrangement of Hoagy Carmichael's song, Stardust. If you look closely, you can see a notation to segue into Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It would never occur to me to interpolate Twinkle Twinkle into Stardust, but I just love that idea. These are some examples of the types of commentary I found, like you'll have to fake this number and this is not a waltz, so watch it. This one's my favorite. It says, at these prices, for Christ's sake, play in tune, watch the stick, and if in doubt, watch the bass player's foot. Generally, I just place the marked parts in the same envelope with the clean set. However, if there are too many of them, I will place them in a separate envelope and catalog it as copy two with a local note. Occasionally, I find additional manuscript parts tucked in with the published arrangements. These we definitely want to keep, and we want to keep them with the published arrangement. They are usually not signed, that is, the name of the arranger is not present on the item, but at least we can know which collection they came from. I make a 590 note in the local record of the presence of additional manuscript parts and the collection they came from. If I know the name of the arranger, I will add it as an added access point. If a specific set has been substantially altered, for instance, an introduction tape to each part, I want to keep the set together and separate from the others. Here is a set of an arrangement of Shuffle Off to Buffalo that belonged to Meredith Wilson, composer of The Music Man, and of a special importance to the foundation. Along with the published parts, there was an order form for the arrangement of an introduction with train effects that Wilson commissioned from Earl Sharp as well as the parts for that introduction. I kept the entire set together in its own envelope, filed next to the original publication as a second copy. The name of the arranger or collection is appended to the call number. The local record has a nice long note about the addition. Rarely there are manuscript arrangements with no published material in them. Because they do not seem to accompany a specific published arrangement, they are kept on their own. For now, they live on their own shelf in composer order, and I make a note of their location in the spreadsheet. I was expecting to find numerous different arrangements of the same song, but I wasn't expecting to find the same arrangement in multiple keys. After some debate, we decided to retain a full set from each published key. Some may argue that if one were to perform it today, one could input it into a finale, which could transpose it to any key you wish at a click of a button. However, in addition to preserving the physical artifacts, we are looking to provide a snapshot of the musical landscape of the time. If nothing else, the fact that a publisher found it worthwhile to publish a song in multiple keys in the days before software made this effortless speaks to the enormous popularity of the song. We have a vocal background arrangement of Deep Purple in seven different keys. Deep Purple was originally released by Paul Whiteman in 1934 and has 266 versions listed on Secondhand Songs, a website that catalogs versions or covers of popular music. Audiovisual catalogers are intimately familiar with the problem I call double trouble. Just like with LPs from that era, sometimes I get an arrangement of a song that has a completely different song on the other side. There's usually no indication of which is first or even that there is another song on the other side. Until I decide how I want to deal with them, I'm currently setting them aside. Other times you get two different arrangements of the same song, like a foxtrot version and a waltz version. These are pretty simple to deal with. Likewise, there's also a series of master score arrangements, that's the title of the series, that include a dance arrangement and two vocal background arrangements, one for male and one for female voice in the same publication. Again, these are straightforward to catalog and deal with. Even with retaining all the marked parts, I still end up with plenty of duplicates. About 70% of the titles I've cataloged have had extras. I have a little checkbox in the database I use for monitoring my cataloging in the collections for extra parts that will allow me to pull a spreadsheet of all the titles that have, well, extra parts. When we find a place to take the duplicates, they will also receive a spreadsheet that has complete title, contributor, including author's access points, 
publication instrumentation, number of parts, genre form, and the OCLC number. I currently have 19 page boxes full of these extra parts in my office. The arrangements are not in any order in the boxes. However, they are in individual folders labeled with composer, title, arranger, and OCLC number. Between this and the spreadsheet that will be accompanying them, the recipient should be in pretty decent shape. So that leaves me with what, what do I do with things that are out of the scope of our collection? Our collection development policy states, the Great American Songbook is the canon of popular music primarily created between the 1920s and the 1960s for Broadway and Hollywood musicals and television. Eligibility criteria include a song's lasting popularity and reinterpretations and the songwriter's nationality, America. While the 1920s to 1960s are considered the golden age of the songbook, many songs have been written and performed since then that have become American classics, which should be included in the songbook. Music that does not generally represent the songbook includes British musical theater or other musicals created and performed outside the US, classical, folk, gospel, beach, electronic, cool jazz, instrumental soundtracks for movies, film noir, and horror. And yet, what do I do with opera arias arranged as foxtrots? Until I'm told differently, I'm using the widest possible interpretation of our scope and erring on the side of retaining things. The line between popular and art music is hazy at best, and songs that started out as art or folk music can quickly become part of the great American songbook through inclusion in a film and subsequent reimagining. To help me in this decision making, I look for recordings of the song. If it's been recorded by artists generally considered to be popular artists as opposed to classical artists, or anybody associated with the songbook, I keep them. I also look to see how they have been cataloged. If they've been cataloged as popular music, I generally keep it. Of the 450 items in the KQW collection, there were only 34 I marked for scope review. At some point, I will need to figure out how to remove the truly out of scope, and there is a ton of it from the collection, and what to do with it. For now, I'm only setting aside those titles from the KQW collection alone, and we'll run them by my team before doing anything else with them. At present, February 2022, processing of KQW is nearly complete. I have catalyzed 676 arrangements of 332 titles. These constitute 1,294 shelf numbers from the original collections. Nearly 75% of them required original cataloging. Of the other 25%, none of them had more than six holding institutions, and the average was less than two. 70% of the arrangements have extra parts that can be deaccessioned. My next steps include working on the processing guide, continuing cataloging of the stock arrangements, and doing archival processing of two collections of original arrangements and compositions by Newton Wayland and Dana Swiss. We plan to continue drawing attention to the collection in the hopes that its materials will be used. As a matter of fact, I had barely embarked on this project when I received a reference request from a, from a woman who had been referred to us by the Paramount Theater. She was looking for an arrangement of Making Whoopi by Walter Donaldson and Gus Kahn as sung by Eddie Cantor in 1930 and Frank Sinatra in 1956. After consulting the spreadsheet, I found several arrangements and comparing them to videos found on YouTube. We determined that this arrangement by Arthur Lang was the one she was looking for. It's always exciting to be able to meet a user's needs and to know that your work is adding value. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested in the Great American Songbook Foundation, please visit our website where you can view our current and past exhibits, our YouTube channel where you can watch our series in the archives with Michael Feinstein, and at our home in Carmel, Indiana. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, here we go. That was a great presentation. And as, um, yeah, I, I can't believe how, how large that question is. I don't even know where you can't either. Yeah. I almost cried my first day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have some time for uh, questions and answers. And let me just remind everyone um, 
that if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A in the right column. Um, I'll try to track things in the chat, but I it won't be something that I'm going to be paying real close attention to. Um, if you would like to use the, uh, if you would like to ask your question anonymously, you can, there's a little slider that you can switch and it won't put your name with your question. If you would like to um, ask your question on screen, put three question marks um, and then hit the button that says share audio or video, try audio and video, and I will see you and I'll bring you up when it's your turn. Um, so we already have a question uh, from Jean Hardin, um, and this is, yeah, it's, her question is, I gather you didn't find it important to keep the pieces in their original collections. Is there any annotation somewhere saying what collection something came from? Yes, um, I keep track of all of that. I'm, I I had a what does what what would Anna do slide that I took out that talked about the database I made because of course I made a database, um, and it does list all of the original BM numbers, the Beth Spassi collection numbers in it, and in the um, item record in the catalog in the local catalog, it does list them all. We don't know if that's going to be useful for somebody but I wanted to make sure that information was maintained. Um, the folders are really falling apart um, and most of them don't have added information on them. Um, yeah, sometimes I wonder if, if we should keep them in the separate collections, but that wasn't, I didn't write the grant proposal, um, but you know, we've talked about that and the Paramount as well had this this idea of making a more um, cohesive collection. So I definitely want to make sure that information is retained. If there's any um, anything specific that came from a particular collection, like that Meredith Wilson thing, I know I know which collection that came from. So if a researcher needed to know that, we can tell them. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, the next question we have from Antoinette, uh, how how do you deliver materials to patrons? For instance, to the whoopee lady. I scanned it and sent it to her. Um, we haven't, that was the only one we've had to deal with. We probably will not be, be sharing the, the physical items. Um, we'll probably be scanning. And we haven't really, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, I guess. All right. Oh, I made Jay White cry. What? What makes me sad? Uh oh, I'm missing something. Okay. Take a screenshot. Okay. Um, Mark Sharp has a question, and he's not going to be on screen. He actually asked it in the in the Q and A. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Um, did you say that some of the collections were from theaters? Uh, whoa. Uh, do they differ in character from broadcast collections? Um, there's one theater, there's the, the Kalen Theater, and it doesn't have the same sort of stock arrangements that I've been primarily working on. So yes, it does It does differ, and I haven't really looked at it at all. All right. Um, Chuck asks, just curious, what's the size of the total holdings of the foundation in addition to those in today's presentation? Uh, I'm not really sure. It's pretty big though. <laughs> it's bigger than 175,000 or whatever you had. <laughs> yeah. We have a new library archive. I, I didn't mention, but Lisa Lobdell retired on July 2nd, uh, six weeks after I started. Um, and we have finally replaced her and we will have a new library and archives director starting in a month. So. Hopefully, you'll be hearing a lot more from us. Great. Um, Andrea has a question. Are you are your original records ending up in OCLC, or did I miss comment on that? They absolutely are. All right. Thanks. Um, Ethan says asks, um, was the presence of additionally retained marked parts noted in the master bib record, or was that a local note? That is only in the local bib, yes. All right, and I think I saw a question over here. Um, question 
from Mark. Do you make fold? Do you make a folder even when a set is missing many parts? I do. Um, a lot of those I'm just setting aside right now um, on an incomplete shelf. Um, if they aren't missing very many, then I go ahead and catalog them and, and say that they're missing whatever part. Okay. Oop, keep coming in. Lots of questions. Uh, where were we? Mark Scharf asks, um, was this collection a one-off acquisition or is the G Great American Songbook Foundation in the market for other acquisitions? <laughs> uh, well, we're always in conversation with people about um, other acquisitions. We've, um, you know, we've we recently received Tommy Toon's stuff. We received, um, got Harold Arlen's piano, which is fun. Um, so we're always getting more accessions. We're not bringing more stuff into the, to this particular collection, which is why I don't consider it a Sisyphean task. Um, but it is a big task. All right. And Jean asks, have you as a foundation considered the copyright issues involved here? Yes, and we're not digitizing them and putting them on, you know, um, widely online. Um, we are an educational facility and a nonprofit, so most of what we we do um, falls under that. We consider it mostly the researchers' responsibility. Um, so, yeah, that is always um, a consideration. Yes. Um, yeah, we've we. At, at our in our shop, which is much smaller and this type of thing, but we do have when we have arrangements, it's like almost often it's impossible to track down who the arrangers are, and you know, so we can't, you know, even if the song itself is in public domain, um, we just don't feel like we can share the the arrangement, and it's 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 not, yeah, it's a little sad that that that's the case, but, but of course, you know. It, that's how it is. Much of our collection, a lot of our collections are arrangements. We have all of Natalie Cole's arrangements, all of Andy Williams' arrangements, um, Nelson Riddle's arrangements, and yeah. All right. I see Suzanne wants to answer, ask a question. Oh, there she is. I'm going to let it promote her to the screen. Since you mentioned arrangements, um, we have several big band collections, and uh, we know in, in a lot of cases who the arrangers were. So, for example, um, in the Benny Goodman papers, we have Eddie Sauter's arrangements. And um, anyway, we were referring uh, researchers who wanted copyright permission to Sauter's son, Greg Sauter. And, uh, and finally, one day he called him, called us up and said, you know, my dad didn't own any copyright in these arrangements. So I think a lot of the arrangements for bands were one off for the band and the arrangers didn't get permission and the songwriters didn't give permission. And so the only copyright is with the original song. It's finally, it's taken me years to kind of grapple with all this. And um, I'm not a copyright lawyer, but I have attended presentations. <laughs> but anyway, I just wondered if, if that would be the case or if these are published, then probably there is some kind of copyright. Is, is that, are these unpublished arrangements or are they published? These are published that I'm working oh, okay. with. Um, so most of them have copyright notices on them. Okay. Um, but with the other ones, that's a lot of that is, that is basically my understanding as well that the Arrangers are paid basically on commission for the thing, and that's what they get, and they don't get like part of the royalties or anything like that. Right, because they didn't even have the composer's permission to make the arrangement in a lot of cases. And they did it for the band, and the band mm -hmm. performed it or maybe recorded it, which of course recordings didn't fall under copyright in that era anyway. Um, but and the songwriters didn't complain because it gave their songs publicity and they made right. their money off selling the sheet music. So it kind of was a symbiotic relationship, I guess. And the arranger got paid when he made the arrangement. That was it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the band got paid, I guess, for their concert or for their dances or for their recordings, maybe. 
Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. I don't know how much it's changed. I, I know one person who does arrangements of songs like this, and they, um, I think they still kind of get paid on commission and don't really receive mm -hmm. royalties or probably even like get a credit in the program or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Suzanne. All right. And we have, it looks like we have one last question. Well, we could have two if somebody else wanted, but Jay asks, Anna, what does your shirt say? My <laughs> shirt says George and Irving and Hoagie and Cole. <laughs> and I made it okay. so you can't buy it anywhere. And we, okay, one last question from Mark. Um, do you have situations where you have both the full arrangement and the sheet music, uh, like vocal score? Yeah, our sheet music is, is separate. Um, very rarely I will find a piece of sheet music tucked in with this arrangement. Um, and there's almost never a score of any sort in, included in these, which is kind of annoying to me, but that's how it is. All right, there's a request for a shirt. Oh yeah? Um, yep. I, I can have a, a sideline. All right. Well, I think we're at time. So thank you, Anna. That was a, a great presentation. And I, um, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to talk to you later about this whole spreadsheet um, method. I, I'd like to know a little more of the mechanics of how you're doing things because we have a lot of, lots of things like this where we get a we get a, a inventory and have to figure out how to convert it to mark. Um, all right, so I'm going to, thanks, bye. bye. We're gonna move on to our next presenter.